Okay, we are recording. So uh, let me just start by saying, hello everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to this fireside chat that's being organized by Tokyo College. Uh, the event is called On Being Human, a dialogue about disability activism with Judy Human. I'm Mark Bookman, currently a postdoctoral fellow at Tokyo College. I'm a historian of uh, disability policy and connected social movements in both Japanese and global contexts. I am beyond thrilled uh, to introduce everyone to a friend and role model of mine, uh, Judy Human. Judy is a lifelong advocate for the rights of disabled people. She's been instrumental in the development and implementation of legislation such as the Americans with Disabilities Act and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which have been advancing inclusion of disabled people um, all across the world. So Judy's memoir, which we're going to be talking about a bit today, is Being Human, an Unrepentant Memoir of a Disability Rights Activist, which was co-authored by Kristen Joyner and published by Beacon Press in 2020. Judy, let me just start by saying, uh, I'm so glad that you could join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I always want to start out by saying I was one of thousands of other disabled people who were involved with laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And I think it's the collective work that many of us did that's really allowed us uh, to get to this place today. And uh, also that the book, um, Being Human, is now in Japanese. Yes, and uh, in the uh, underneath this video in the comment section, as well as in our advertising, we'll make sure that there's a link uh, to the Japanese version as well. Thank you. Uh, of course. Um, so let me start by just saying, you know, your story is incredible. Uh, I was familiar with a little bit of it before I read the book, but having read the book several times over now, I'm blown away every time. Um, but there's something that I have to admit, it's a bit hard for me to grasp. And that's, you know, I grew up in the United States with the ADA and with the Americans with Disabilities Act. I was born in 1991 um, as that legislation was coming in. So I have one understanding of a worldview that's shaped by some amount of disability rights legislation. I have an idea of, of what the world is like post the ADA, but I can't really fully grasp what life might have been like before that legislation was in place. And if I can't do that as a disabled person, I suspect for many of our viewers, disabled and non-disabled, it might be it might be hard to imagine. So I was hoping to get us started with a bit of context and just ask. You know, what's something that today we take for granted as being part of a disability rights framework or being part of our environment or education or employment? What's something that exists now that might not have existed uh, when you were uh, coming up in the, the 1950s, the 1960s? So I, I also think that we need to look at laws that came before uh, the ADA and one in particular uh, Section 504, which is a provision of law, uh, which is a part of something called the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And we can get into talking about that more later. But basically, uh, Section 504 stated that any entity like a hospital, a school, a university, state or local government, transportation, any entity that was getting money from the federal government was not it basically stated you were not going to be able to discriminate against someone with a disability based on their disability. Now, why that's very important is that meant um, 17 years before the ADA became law, there was work that was beginning to happen. And in the United States, even a few years before that, in 1968, there was a piece of legislation passed which 
required that if federal money was being used for construction of streets and sidewalks, that they would have to have curb cuts. So you could see that there was nationally incremental legislation. And then what state were you born in? I was born in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania likely had legislation in place uh, before the ADA that would have been requiring, you know, similar things to what the ADA requires. So for the audience, I think it's important to understand that, you know, the United States is a very big country. We have 50 states and some territories. And uh, when a national law is passed, it means that the entire country must comply with that law. Uh, but, and it's basically the, the floor. States before the ADA came into being were doing work, particularly in Northern states that were addressing issues like accessibility. Um, and part of that was the result of the Second World War where um, people who would previously have died uh, were now living because of advanced medications like penicillin. So you had, after 1945, uh, many soldiers who came back to the United States and then were uh, engaged with disabled veterans organizations. One of those groups uh, is called Paralyzed Veterans of America. And at that time in New York, I was born in 1947 and I had polio in 1949. And uh, basically I was 18 months old and haven't walked since I had polio independently. Um, the uh, veterans organizations began to start looking within their states at what were some of the barriers that needed to be addressed like new construction, uh, ramps into buildings, wider bathroom doors. So they started working on this really in the 50s and 60s. When I look back on what my life was like in the earlier years, um, it was very low expectations of what we would be able to do, for example, if we had physical disabilities. Um, I didn't get a motorized wheelchair, I think, you know, it's interesting for people uh, to realize, like yourself, Mark, that um, motorized wheelchairs really didn't become more common until the 70s and progressively as the years have gone by. So uh, there weren't motorized wheelchairs in the 50s. And then uh, in the 60s, when they slowly began to become more commonplace, my father didn't want me to get one because he thought I would become too dependent on the chair, which I think later on he realized was kind of silly because the motorized wheelchair gave me freedom that I didn't have before. But, you know, when I was like, until I was like 21, um, I had to have people push my wheelchair. And um, in the 50s and 60s, really in the 70s, slowly we started seeing ramps on corners of streets. But for those of you who have read the book or who will read the book, you'll see there's a, towards the beginning where I talk about my friend pushing my wheelchair to a candy store and going out of our neighborhood. And I describe in pretty great detail what had to be done to get across the street. So my friend had to turn my wheelchair around backwards, um, bump me down the step, and then likewise get me up on the other corner to get up the other step. Now um, in the US and many countries around the world, certainly including Japan, uh, having ramps on the corners of streets is very commonplace. 
but it it really wasn't when I was, as I said, um, really through college. And then I think issues like um, not having bathrooms that were accessible because it wasn't a requirement. So it would mean that if I was going to go out, I had to really be careful about what I was going to drink because they didn't want to have to go to the bathroom because um, I couldn't go by myself. And, um, you know, I was not necessarily with people who knew how to help me. So, you know, every kind of basic day-to-day -day activity, go to the movies with your friends. We had a movie theater in our neighborhood, but definitely don't drink because I'd be in the movies for three, four hours and, you know, couldn't go to the bathroom. Also problems like some movie theaters would say you couldn't stay in your wheelchair. You had to get out of your wheelchair and they would move your wheelchair away from you. And that was something that was, you know, dangerous as well, because if, uh, God forbid, there was a fire and you couldn't walk, what would you do to get to your wheelchair? So I would say the landscape, the physical environment has definitely not only dramatically changed, but there is an expectation now from people who don't realize what existed before that when certain things aren't there, now I'm talking about people who don't have disabilities or don't have obvious disabilities, they're asking, well, where is the electric door opener? And, you know, all the kinds of questions. And, you know, like in Japan, here in the United States and other countries, the trains now have elevators, more of them. And so people don't remember what it was like when there weren't elevators to get you to the train. And so, you know, there is an expectation uh, that there will be elevators. And if there isn't an elevator, people are like, why isn't there an elevator? So I think what's very important about um, the laws and most importantly, I think, the work that the disability communities have been doing in countries like Japan and the United States to get people to understand what we want in life is to be able to participate like non-disabled people. And uh, we need to be able to be strong and uh, continue to fight for many things, accessibility being one of them. So the world, I think, has really uh, dramatically changed. Employment also was a very big issue. And when you look at Section 504, as I was mentioning, which um, only covers entities that are getting money from the federal government. So there was a limited impact um, because like a private company that didn't get money from the federal government, unless their state had a law um, making it illegal to discriminate against someone based on disability, you didn't have protection. So when I graduated from college in 1969, I was applying for jobs. Uh, one job I applied for was to be a social worker. And I had an interview over the phone. It was a great interview. And um, the woman who interviewed me, we set up a time to come in to do a face-to-face -face interview because the job was gonna be obviously in person. And um, when I got off the phone, I realized I didn't ask if there was a wheelchair entrance and if so, where it was. So I called back and I said, oh, I use a wheelchair. Where's the entrance I can use to get into the building? And she said, I'll call you back. And she called me back and said, there's no need to come in for an interview. Now, at that point, I was young. There was no 504. There was no ADA. Uh, I don't think there were any laws in New York at that point that made what happened illegal. So that was my first real foray into the employment 
field where blatantly I was denied even a second interview because of my wheelchair. Then simultaneously with that, I was also, I minored at the University of Education and I was pursuing a career in teaching and took all of the courses I needed to take past the written and the oral test. And it's important to note that these tests that were required to be passed in order to be a teacher were all offered in inaccessible buildings, one or two flights of steps. So if I wanted to take the test, I had to get friends to help me up the steps, which of course I did. I was failed on my medical exam, uh, which today or after 1973 would have been illegal, but in 1970, 71 wasn't. So I passed, as I said, my written exam, my oral exam, and I was failed on my medical exam. So I had to make a decision about what to do and was fortunate to be able to get two lawyers um, who represented me and I ultimately went to court and got my job. But you can see uh, it's not that today disabled people applying for teaching positions might not have difficulty. Um, one can be denied something in a way that isn't as blatant as what happened with me because my denial for my teaching job was paralysis of both lower extremities, sequelae of poliomyelitis. So it was clear in writing that I was being denied the job because I couldn't walk. Walking was not an essential part of the job. So there was no reason um, why I couldn't be given the job, which as I said, I ultimately got and taught three years in New York City. But there have been uh, many changes like the ones I'm discussing. But I think one of the most important changes that has gone on has been the growth of the disability rights movement. So there are, you know, in almost every country, there are disability rights organizations. Some are smaller, some are larger, some there are many organizations, some there are fewer organizations, but the voices of disabled people who have physical disabilities causes, you know, where we know, Mark, that you have a form of dystrophy, I had polio. So people with all different types of disabilities that may cause mobility disabilities or hearing or sight or mental health or intellectual disabilities or cancer, any one of the thousands of disabilities that are out there, we have been seeing a, a growing um, movement where people are beginning to tell their own stories and are really working against discrimination, fighting for their individual rights. But I think in Japan and the United States, one thing that we've seen is really a, a growing movement of what I would call cross disability. Thank you so much for that. There's so much that I want to dive into and unpack. I'm not even sure where to start, but let me um, let, let me pick up on one thing that I heard that really resonated with me. Um, you know, in terms of the growing disability movement and in terms of in access to different parts of society, there's a connection that I see that I'm curious if this uh, if you saw this in, in your story as well. But I think, you know, when you, for at least physical disability, and I think this also applies to other types of disability to a certain extent, if you increase access to the built environment, you enable access to things like education to some extent. If you enable access to education to some extent, then qualification for employment becomes possible. If you enable qualification for employment, you enable some degree of payment or some degree of savings 
which can then allow for entertainment and different types of expenditure. And yes, there are barriers that can occur at every step. Yes, these different spaces can be divided. Um, and yes, it's, it's not necessarily a straight path. But one thing that I've seen um, in Japan, and I'm curious if this is true in your experience in the US, is as these movements grow and as one barrier is toppled, the pressure to remove the next one in this sort of sequence grows. And the people uh, who work together to create a cross disability movement grows. If we enable more people to get access to education, then they're able to have more conversations with more individuals. More employment means more opportunities for changing the business sector, um, and not just for the individual, but for these entire movements. So I'm curious, you know, coming up in, uh, in a time when there wasn't uh, the ADA, I mean, we had 504 from the, the mid 1970s, but, you know, but before then, I guess I just want to know a little bit about um, how you saw these things connecting. You, know, you mentioned the barriers in your community, how your friend had to push you um, up the non the, the non existent uh, curb cut into the candy store. You know, I imagine that affected your your access to to um, education as well. And I imagine school was probably quite tough. Um, in fact, uh, since I've read your book, I can say, yes, it probably was. But I was hoping you might tell our audience a little bit about some of the barriers you encountered in the educational setting, um, the issues that you had in, in school. So I think that was a, a really um, key part of your story from what I read. Anyway. Yeah, so um, thank you for the question, Mark. Uh, let me make, so I will discuss uh, my experiences in education. I want to deviate just for a second on the term education. Um, I think what's very important about what is happening as, as disabled people are becoming more visible within the community is that non-disabled people are seeing us in the community. And that was something that didn't really happen that much when I was younger because of all the um, lack of accessibility. I think that younger people today are much less resistant to the inclusion of disabled people um, because they are being educated in a non-formal way uh, by seeing us like in Japan seeing disabled people on the train, seeing disabled people in stores, seeing disabled people in, uh, albeit too few schools, but more schools and at universities. I'm still, I think, albeit too small. But nonetheless, I think um, the media is doing a little better job in representing uh, both issues around disability and also having disabled people um, you know, on the screen and behind the screen. So to me, that's what one could call informal education, um, disability studies being taught at some universities in Japan and a growing number of universities in the United States. I think one of the reasons why we are seeing some changes is, as I said, the younger generation who is not as biased as uh, many older people. But even there, I think it's fair to say that there are changes going on across society and that one of the real important uh, aspects of having a growing uh, disability rights movement is that you know we are present and we can really be influencing in a way that we weren't, you know, decades ago. And I'm sure you see this for yourself, you know, both in the United States and in Japan. But education uh, in the United States was not addressed in uh, legislation and at a national level until Section 504 
which remember what I said, any entity getting money from the federal government. So that included all our uh, public educational systems, both uh, primary, secondary school and higher education. And uh, IDEA, which came about in 1975, but I was born in 1947. Uh, my mother took me to school in 1952 or 1953 when I was uh, five years old. And uh, we knew that the school was not accessible, had steps, but my parents had no expectation that I wouldn't be allowed to go to that school um, because they fully expected that they would, my mother would take me to school like she took my brothers and she'd pull me up the steps like she did when I went to Hebrew school to study Hebrew after school, but that's not what happened. So what happened was my mother took me to school. The principal said, no, I was a fire hazard. I couldn't go to that school. So that was for kindergarten. So I didn't go to kindergarten at all. And then in the first grade, second grade, third grade, half of the fourth grade, I was the Board of Education in New York City was sending a teacher to my house. Now, were, she, were they sending a teacher to my house from 8.30 to 3? No. I received a teacher two times a week, once for an hour, once for an hour and a half. So that, that was a total of two and a half hours a week for three and a half years. So, you know, the discussion about receiving a uh, such a small amount of education, it was very clear as I was getting older that people didn't have the same expectations of me. Of course, my family had the same expectations and my mother was continually trying to figure out a way of getting me into school because they thought both from a learning perspective academically but then also being in school with other kids was important. So uh, when I finally did start literally going to a school, um, I went to a school that was for non-disabled children, but in the basement were the classes for disabled children. So I never went to any classes uh, in elementary school um, with non-disabled kids. It was home instruction and then uh, in the segregated classes. And then when I went to high school, the high school in our neighborhood uh, that my friends went to were not accessible. But my mother and some other parents had really uh, fought with the Board of Education to get schools made accessible so that people of my generation who would have previously gone back on home instruction for high school, uh, we were able, many of us were able to go to high schools and we had support in the high schools. Um, you know, people there who could help push our wheelchairs. Remember, there were no motorized wheelchairs. The bathrooms weren't accessible. All these different things were going on. So, there were many children with, with uh, more significant disabilities, including intellectual disabilities, who were either not in school or were not in inclusive classrooms. Um, the laws that we have in place now have really been doing a number of things. I think one of the very important parts about laws like Section 504 the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act from a child perspective is that many parents are also becoming stronger advocates and are insisting that their children be going to school with non-disabled children. And the law itself obligates our state departments of education and local school districts to ensure that children 
are educated in what we would call the least restrictive environment, uh, meaning that um, a child could be in a regular classroom all day. They may need supports and that would be something that should be provided. And it may mean that they uh, leave the classroom to go to another classroom to study uh, certain subjects or to be able to get tutoring, whatever it may be. But there is an expectation that children A will be in school and B will be in the least restrictive environment. Now, in saying that, there are many more children today who are in fact in regular schools, in regular classrooms, but there still is a problem. I would say does not compare to the problem in Japan, but there still is a problem of parents not getting the support that they believe their child needs and all types of things that are going on to fight that. But we've definitely made many advancements. Universities, more and more universities are graduating uh, people in the field of teaching where they're being what we would say in English, dual certified as a general ed teacher and a special ed teacher. Uh, which means that the teachers are prepared to work in diverse classrooms, uh, definitely way more than before. So there are positive things going on. Now, my encounters with education in Japan, and I haven't been there since about 2015 or 16. So I don't know how dramatically things have improved. But um, it seemed to me there were a few things going on. It was more likely that disabled children were included in kindergarten or in the earlier years, but that as they were getting older, they were no longer included like they had been when they were younger. I know this is an issue that uh, people have been working on. Um, would you say there have been a lot of improvements? Um, there have been a few, but they've been slow coming in my, uh, in my, from my perspective. So you mentioned coming in 2015, 2016. Well, 2016 is when Japan enacted the law for the elimination of discrimination against persons with disabilities. And that was the first law that codified reasonable accommodation um, in schools. So from that point in time uh, that we did see some uh, increased efforts towards integration, increased efforts towards teaching about what in Japanese would be called a barrier-free mindset, um, kokoro no barrier-free uh, in uh, secondary education. So we uh, instruct disabled and non-disabled students together about the importance of learning from each other, about the importance of understanding uh, different capabilities and needs uh, across diversity, not just disability. There were a number of, uh, of attempts to diversify education. Um, but if you look at the current statistics, you know, 1% of college students identify as disabled right now in Japan. Um, and that number has really not shifted that much. And if, uh, from my perspective, a lot of that stems from, from two things, uh, both of which we've, we've talked about to some extent. And the first is there are so many barriers just to get to higher education from the built environment to access to appropriate medical care to an inclusive um, elementary school, middle school, high school environment. There are so many requirements and barriers to pass just to get to that point. Um, that the number of, of disabled students is still quite low. And of course, if, uh, I feel like I didn't tell you this, but, but for our audience, you know, if you cannot get uh, qualifications, uh, because let's say I can't get a college degree if I'm disabled, well, then I, it's very unlikely that I'll end up in a specialist field where I'll be able to reshape education, right? Um, so, so there's a pipeline problem that I think is still going on. Um, and uh, one big part of this in Japan, 
and I suspect it's true in the U.S., but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, is the, the, the understanding of reasonable accommodation is quite um, vague and scattered. Uh, and that is partially because it's still a relatively new concept uh, under the law here. And But even as we gain tons of case studies and examples of, of best practices around what accommodation should be in the classroom, it seems that implementation has, has been a separate issue. Um, the, the, the one thing that separates Japan a little bit, um, if I could speak to that, is just as a country with the world's fastest aging population, where roughly 30% is over the age of 65, uh, where there is uh, you know, recently having held the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and Paralympic Games, uh, there's been a lot of pressure for a bunch of reasons that have helped raise awareness around disability inclusion. And that has given um, a push to this attempt to integrate educational uh, settings. But, it, um, but again, even with that, for as much awareness as there is of the need for it, the awareness of how to implement it still seems to be lagging. Um, you know, I, I'm curious, uh, from your perspective in the U.S., is reasonable accommodation something that still remains uh, ambiguous and a problem in terms of implementation? I mean, I would say um, reasonable accommodations need to be those that are really adjusted uh, towards the individual person. And so, I mean, obviously, one of the areas that you work on a lot is creation of the built environment so that you're not needing to look at making, you know, many, in some cases, any modification to the built environment if, in fact, things are newly constructed or renovated. So um, that's one area. But I think also on the issue of teaching and learning, I think one of the big issues is our teachers learning enough about what they need to be doing to work with what I call diverse learners. Not all children, you know, all children do not advance at the same level. Let's just skip anything around disability. Some children are slower in math, some are slower in reading. Now, if the teachers are not being trained on how to work uh, with students who may need uh, more supports, again, not necessarily from a disability perspective, those children who are not able to learn as quickly as others also begin to fall to the wayside. And some of those children may or may not have a learning disability. Um, so I think one of the critical issues is that, and I really don't know how this is being handled in Japan, but that uh, in, at the university level, uh, both the undergraduate and graduate level, whether or not teachers are really being uh, taught enough about um, good pedagogy, which includes students who may have disabilities um, or students who just learn differently. Um, so I, I would say here, you know, it depends on where you are, the state you're in, the school district you're in, what college and university you've gone to. Um, and, you know, the commitment of the State Department of Education, as well as the local school district. Um, there is a lot more work that's gone on in the last, you know, 40 years since the IDEA came in place. Uh, looking at ways to help teachers uh, teach more effectively and also um, looking at the kinds of uh, modifications and accommodations students might need. And then of course, I think technology also has really been a boon for some students um, in many, many ways and making sure that they're getting accessible technology. So overall, I would say we are definitely better than we were in the 1970s or 80s. Uh, we are not yet where we need to be. Too many children are still not um, getting what they need, as you were saying, to be able to be successful in school and be competitive to 
go on to higher education. But I want to say that, you know, here, um, we definitely have way more than 1% students at colleges and universities. I would say, you know, in many places, it's between 10 and 20%. Now, in looking at that number, um, it's also uh, looking at many students who are not blind or deaf or have physical disabilities, but students with mental health disabilities, um, invisible disabilities, diabetes, asthma, whatever it may be, and where accommodations are very important. And so uh, disability services offices on college campuses, which will do everything from help students uh, get their materials uh, recorded, get them scribes, whatever they may need, um, issues around captioning of materials, sign language interpreters, We've also seen a growing movement in the last, I would say 15, 20 years of colleges that are beginning to have programs for students with intellectual disabilities. I don't know if this is going on in Japan, but here uh, some of these students don't graduate with a regular degree, but they are on college campuses. They are taking many different courses. And again, I think both their learning, which is so important, but also the learning then is that's happening for everybody else at the college and uni or university, uh, which will impact both the disabled student's ability to be trained and prepared for work, but also is exposing you know, the future businessmen and women of our countries to uh, you know, being in classrooms with students with disabilities, becoming friends with people they never met before. So these changes are slow, but I would say there are many positive things that are happening. I mean, the 1% is, the, what is the definition that they're using? So the 1% the is a survey by the Japan Association of Student Services Organizations, or JASO which is a, a government entity that basically keeps track of students who identify with the Disability Services Office using a government registered passbook. And that passbook could be for physical, developmental, or, or, or other kinds of disabilities as well. Um, so these are folks who have been through a rigorous uh, medicalized process of becoming diagnosed. Um, and um, there are many, many places to fall through the cracks in that process, which I think is part of the reason why the number is so low. Um, it's pro realistically, the, the, the percentage of disabled students is probably uh, a bit higher than that for some types of disabilities, a bit lower than that for other types of disabilities. And there is disaggregated data available to some extent, but uh, either way, the number is still quite low and I think uh, a big part of that problem from what I see personally is Japanese universities, much like many American universities, tend to be very highly decentralized. Um, so you have the Office of Student Disability Services might not be talking to the researchers working on disability on campus, who might not be talking to the disabled students on campus who need services, who might not be aware of the alumni networks that are doing different things. Each uh, sector of the university is operating in its own path. And while they're all doing good, important work towards inclusion, um, there's not a lot of room or precedent for collaboration. Um, and that's starting to change, especially as we have more and more students get through the pipeline and start demonstrating to universities the value of having all these different services provided by these higher education institutes working together, showing that it's actually more cost efficient in most cases, both for the university and for the student in terms of empowering them to do what they want to do. Uh, that, that's been a growing dialogue um, over here as a plate. And that actually raises uh, another question I was hoping to ask you 
which is, you know, oftentimes having a law or a policy alone, having a system in place around accommodation or inclusion is, is not enough to affect change. There has to be some other type of pressure. And as I was reading through your, your memoir, at different stages, you describe a couple of different uh, modes of activism and protests and, um, and, and petitions that you engaged in. Um, and I was just curious to hear a little bit more. You know, we've spoken about Section 504 a couple of times in, in this, this conversation. You know, I, I know that after 504 was enacted, um, it didn't necessarily change things overnight, right? Um, just because we introduced laws to say no discrimination, like the laws that were passed in Japan in 2016, it doesn't necessarily produce change immediately. So what type of strategies, you know, can we use or, or what, what can we think about to make sure that policies are not just enacted, but implemented? Do you have any, any advice on that? Well, I think it's very important. There are many components. One, I think in Japan, like here in the US and other countries, the motivation behind these laws came very much from the disability community, parents and allies. The government in and of itself did not wake up one day without any pressure from the disability community, broadly speaking and say, oh, we recognize that we are discriminating against disabled people all the time in every uh, province. Do you have, is it provincial or states? What? Oh, in, in Japan, it's prefectural. Prefecture, in every prefecture. Yeah. Um, and therefore we wanna do right. That's not the way it happens. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, I participated in at least one very powerful demonstration in Japan on accessibility in the transport system. Uh, I definitely know that there are many groups in Japan who are very strong um, disability rights groups and are pressuring government not only to pass laws, but to implement laws. Now here, I would say there are a number of things. One is, when a law is passed here, there's something called regulations, rules which explain what the purpose of the law is, what it is, and what it isn't. Um, definitely what it is. So in the case of 504, as an example, um, it became a law in 1973. And then 504, is a very small provision, like 42 words. And it, it said you couldn't discriminate against someone based on disability, but it didn't define what disability was. It didn't define what discrimination could be. And it didn't define what the remedies could be. So it was between 1973 and 1977 that these regulations or rules were written and finally were um, adopted by the government, which meant that, remember what I said earlier, that these laws are a floor. And so it meant that every state was going to have to uh, accept the rules that came out from 504 and later in the 90s as a result of ADA. And we also, I think, have a system which, and you could please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in the US, if you believe you've been discriminated against, uh, you have different options. Sometimes you go into the company or organization, you file a complaint, internally, or you can go to a government agency um, like the Department of Justice, our federal employment agency, housing, education, whatever. And also when states have laws, you can also file complaints and in some cases go to court 
at the state level. So we have many various opportunities where one can say, I believe I've been discriminated against because of my disability in the following way. And I want you government to investigate and determine whether I have been discriminated against. And if so, um, what are you government going to tell the entity that discriminated against me that they need to do? And then if you get a finding in your favor and there is a letter or whatever that's sent saying, we find in favor of, you know, Mark Bookman, that he alleged discrimination in employment. We reviewed it, we agree with him. Now you have to take these corrective actions. So does the government, does the entity that found in your favor um, now follow up to make sure that something's happening. So all of these are very important aspects and are, are part of our laws, not just in the area of disability. Also, um, we have had training programs. So both for 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, there were like five years of training where organizations competed for money. They responded to a request for a proposal that came out from the government, federal government, and uh, got a certain amount of money every year. They worked with the government on putting materials together to explain what uh, 504 or ADA, uh, what the law said, what the rules are. And so there were thousands of people that were trained in the United States on what 504 is, what 504 isn't, um, what the ADA is, what the ADA isn't. And that was very important. I would say we need to do more of this um, because it is very important for people to understand what the law uh, protects them, how it protects them. And if you don't understand uh, how that can happen, you're not going to use it. I also think, you know, if you look at Japan and the US, um, we are, I guess, a more aggressive uh, group of people where we um, don't as much hesitate about something like filing a complaint. Now, I don't want to generalize because, you know, many of the people in the United States who live here are immigrants from other countries. Those immigrants may not be coming from countries where complaints are something that people do, or they may have been adverse impact if someone filed a complaint against a person uh, that might make them hesitant to do it. So, you know, it's not perfect at all. But I do think the issue of training people is very important. What are your rights? Now, in the case of ADA and 504, the government has been supporting many different kinds of technical assistance programs. One of them is called the Job Accommodations Network. The Job Accommodations Network has been funded, oof, I think, since the 1980s. And it focuses only on employment-related issues under ADA and 504. So anybody, Joe Blow on the street, um, if they have a question um, about employment, for example, I'm an employer and I'm wondering, can I ask Mark, what is your disability? I don't know the answer. Maybe if I ask, that's a problem. So if you know about this Job Accommodations Network, um, you can go on it and you can read it or you can call them. And then you can find out what you're allowed to ask and what you're not allowed to ask, which can be very important. So um, the Job Accommodations Network, as an example, 
has been a very important entity for many decades now. And people from other countries also come and look at what the Job Accommodations Network is and how it can help people. But in addition to that, we have nine regional technical assistance centers. And those technical assistance centers um, cover the entire United States and they are available for trainings, uh, sharing information, um, answering questions, doing public speaking to entities. Um, and likewise, we have um, centers for independent living that have a technical assistance center. We have parent training programs of which there are about 100 in the US and they have a technical assistance program. So technical assistance is a very big part, not just in the area of disability, but certainly in the area of disability. So it can allow those people who are working in the various fields, as well as disabled people to um, ask questions, get answers, go on websites, read materials. So there, there's two... Uh... Two comments I want to I want to make here, if I may. The first is, you know, uh, the the two issues that always come to mind in terms of pro a problem resolution methods is stigma and awareness, right? You know, awareness. Do you know where the reporting structures are? Who you can complain to? How you can complain to them? And stigma. Are you comfortable complaining to them? Does that potentially put you in a worse situation? uh for, for physically financially socially um there are these two sort of intersecting problems that i think uh remain a big pro a big concern here in japan folks are, are often concerned um disabled individuals themselves worry about stigma and retribution if they fire if they were to file complaints and employers uh are not necessarily aware of how to deal with that dynamic. Uh, and as you say, having these technical assistance programs and consultation centers in various forms, whether they're connected via um, centers for independent living or for via other organizations, having uh, a sort of recognizable and uh, to a certain extent stigma-free or stigma-mitigated um, consultation network, I think is really important. And I think that's something that we need to see, you know, even if it has existed for a long time, and I know it has, seeing more of them more, more active, I think is really important uh, and something that I hope Japan uh, starts to do. Um, but I, I wanted to really pick up on one other dynamic that uh, came out in your last set of comments, which is the idea of, of cultural specificity and cultural learning here and how you know, the different cultures are operated in different ways. Immigrants might be coming from a country that has a very different understanding of what is appropriate when it comes to disability, what is appropriate when it comes to reporting about discrimination, what is appropriate when it comes to standards of accommodation or accessibility. Um, I think that one, uh, one thing that I, I'm personally interested in, and, and I know that from your work, you've, you've done a lot of, um, or have a lot of experience with is thinking about how cultures, how cultures can learn from and teach each other with respect to disability rights and inclusion. Um, and I was really particularly uh, interested in thinking about uh, the 1980s. You know, you mentioned taking part in this big protest in Japan uh, forgive me, but I'm imagining you're talking about the Rehabilitation International protest of 1988. Is that the one you're thinking about in Shimbashi? It could uh, be. Yeah, it was um, on transportation. Yeah, it was a big, yeah. like a, a hundred wheelchair users or something, not, a, a fair number going down to big yes. train station. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I happen to, to be familiar with that one from the Japan side of things. Um, but I'm you know, uh, I know that protest happened, you know, before the ADA was passed. 
Uh, and I know it happened during a time when activists from across the world were coming together. You know, this was after the United Nations International Year of Disabled Persons in 1981. There were uh, tons of different groups of people coming together to think about how to coordinate strategies for international activism. Um, and I guess my, my question, just to put a fine point on it, is, you know, I know for the ADA, for instance, it's it's often characterized in Japan as, you know, this this global benchmark that that set that set the world uh, set the new standard for the world. I'm curious, you know, to what extent did those international conversations before the ADA play a role in shaping how the ADA was designed from your perspective? And what have you seen the ADA done for other countries uh, in your work, for instance, at the, the World Institute on Disability or World Bank? Um, I realize it's a, it's a two-sided question, but, but, but I'd like to hear just a little bit about those global flows, if you will. So I would say um, one thing when I, with Ed Robertson, Joan Leon set up the World Institute on Disability. Uh, the, one of the first issues we started working on was personal assistance. Because um, we knew from Ed and I from travels that we'd been doing earlier and people we'd been meeting from other countries that personal assistance services was more available in many countries. And again, this issue in the US because everything is in some way, states have something different. And so we were trying to find out both what was going on in every state in the United States on personal assistance services. And we looked at additionally, I think three other countries to look at how they were addressing personal assistance. So I would say in the area of personal assistance, uh, we definitely were learning about how there was you know, greater uniformity in eligibility criteria and the services that were being provided. Although, you know, like anything, uh, the decisions about the number of hours, for example, somebody was getting was also based on the reviewer and the county they were coming from. And yeah, but uh, the uniformity in systems was much was dramatically different than here. And uh, since one of our objectives at WID was to really be able to have a research project which would allow people to see the differences in programs, I would say that was very important. Uh, likewise, in the area of healthcare, uh, many of us were learning about issues of national health care in really most other countries around the world and all other ally countries and the fact that we don't have that in the US. So that's another area where I feel like we were learning, people were complaining in other countries about not getting what they needed, da 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 da, da which are always issues that are true and not everyone is getting what they need the way they believe they need it. But here you were dealing with something quite dramatically different where many people were not having any healthcare coverage at all. And the lack of uniformity in healthcare coverage from state to state. So I would say both in personal assistance services and in the area of healthcare that we were and are still learning. And we have some good models going on here, but like national models, not like you can see in other countries. Um, that's one area. I would also um, say that I always felt that we really were ahead of other countries when it comes to rights-based issues. Uh, not only laws that address issues of discrimination, affirmative action, et cetera, but that these laws were built on laws that were developed for uh, black and people of color, people from the LGBTQ community, from the women's community, 
that we had been excluded from as far as disability was concerned, but that we worked a lot in coalition, that it was a big issue for us to be working with groups like the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights as um, we were moving forward with various laws. So, you know, within the United States itself, uh, the whole issue of human rights, justice, um, organizations that have been around, you know, for a hundred years um, is something that I think we show people that is different than not in all countries, but then in many countries. So I would say like our laws on accessibility, much better than most other countries. Um, yeah. So again, our floors versus ceilings, um, very different than in many other countries, even, yeah, I mean, some of the laws that I've seen in prefectures in Japan, you know, I think the lack of a national law. And then you can see that they're not, they're definitely not as strong as here. I would say like in construction, you know, it's the public and private sector, both have to comply. And in many places it's, the public sector that has to comply, not the private sector. That was one of the important parts of the ADA is that it got rid of this distinction. And employment, I mean, obviously um, the ADA and Title I under employment, I think is really much stronger than most other countries. Yeah. Um... I mean, I know for a fact from the Japan side of things, there was a lot of learning from the ADA um, and also a lot of discussion of the differences in the civil rights coalitions that you mentioned. I mean, I know when uh, the concept of independent living and the, the movement that you and, and Roberts and, and so many other people had uh, started in the US uh, began to translate over into Japan, there was a big discussion of how that translation would happen in terms of services without um, a similar civil rights movement background as a source of pressure. You know, what, what, could, what would work in the Japanese context to pass laws and policies to enable access to services and supports um, if you didn't have that civil rights uh, background? That was a big discussion. This is where, um, when you look, for example, at Centers for Independent Living in mm -hmm. states like New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, California, where we've got both the federal laws, but then stronger state laws. So California, for example, has had um, money for personal assistance services um, since the 50s that's been growing over those years and at one point was completely state funded and then as another federal law our medicaid law came into being the state switched over more to get more federal money from medicaid but um i would say that you know when cil started uh, when the Boston Center started, when it, one of the centers in Michigan started, there was no ADA and there was no 504. Um, and even though 504 came about, it took, you know, until 1977 for those rules to come out. So I think a lot of what we were doing was really um, being driven by also trying to get laws within our states that in many cases were stronger than the federal laws. And um, I think we were probably less into compromising um, than I've seen sometimes in Japan. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, th th that's a really important insight. Thank you for that. Let's pause um, for one second. I'm going to have to get off in a couple of minutes. Oh, no second. problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just going to uh, move towards the last question, actually. Um, so I good, good timing. Um, but okay. Um, well, yeah, before we jump back into the to the unedited section, um, I was going to ask about either the uh, U.S. having not ratified the CRPD and some of the problems you ran into in convincing folks to ratify, or just move on to a thought, like do any final thoughts. Um, would you prefer I that I include? Know. I agree. Okay. So, okay. Mark, as you know, only a handful of countries around the world have not ratified the CRPD. The United States is one of those, unfortunately. When President Obama was in office, he signed uh, the CRPD. But in order for it to have the impact uh, of a, a force within the United States, it also has to be ratified. And the way ratification goes in the United States and every country is different, the way they ratify a treaty. In our country, two thirds of the Senate we have a House and a Senate. House is not involved at all. Two thirds of the Senate must agree to recommend to the president that the treaty, in this case, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, be ratified, in which case he would then sign ratification. Um, anybody who follows the news, I think, knows, unfortunately, that right now there are more major divisions between Democrats and Republicans um, and not frequently a meeting ground where we can um, negotiate. And that's what, what has been getting worse over the years. And uh, basically I was working in the State Department. I was the special advisor for international disability rights um, at the State Department. And we, um, with the Secretary's Office and the White House, were working on, uh, in the Senate, with the appropriate committee, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, to both get hearings where we would testify and others could testify opposing ratification. And basically, we had um, a couple of tries at it. Uh, the first try, we thought we were. We thought we were going to be able to uh, get the 67 votes that we needed. Uh, we had a man named Senator Dole, who was a Republican, a disabled person who fought very hard for the CRPD, worked a lot with a group called the United States International Council on Disability, um, and ultimately with uh, the government and civil society working really hard to try to get this vote to occur favorably, we're not successful. We got a few Republicans um, five Republicans uh, who voted for ratification, but we couldn't get to the 67. Uh, we had opposition from groups that we never had heard of before, a group called the Homeschoolers, who are not even a large group, but they were saying things like the United Nations was going to come in and take children away from parents, really quite um, untrue statements. So we have not been successful. And I would say that's true, not just for the CRPD, but there are many treaties. Well, there are many treaties that we have ratified. There are many treaties we haven't. Uh, CEDAW, we haven't. Um, C the uh, Rights of the Child, we haven't. And CRPD, we haven't. It sounds and what are the like next steps? I mean, I think the next steps are that we need to continue 
to grow our movement, working with organizations like the International Disability Alliance, but then also within our own countries and within our own states or provincial areas, uh, continuing to fight for rights, fight for change, and address some of the issues, Mark, that you were discussing. Stigma, fear of speaking up, fear of retribution. Um, I think that's something really that um, government and the private sector really have responsibility for, to really be working with disabled people uh, in whatever entity uh, needs to be engaged in this to learn about the kinds of discrimination people are experiencing, uh, what responsibilities each entity should be taking, and ultimately whether or not you have a law which is strong enough and whatever you have, you have to work with it right now, but looking at what you're doing to ensure that people who should have protections under these laws at least understand what's there now and uh, try to work towards implementation of what currently exists and you can work down the road on strengthening these laws. And that we are a, we are a global community. So continuing to learn from each other because we have a lot to learn from each other. And what a perfect note to end on. I think, uh, well, you know, I'm in complete agreement with you. We'll keep learning from each other. We'll keep talking. You know, this conversation is just the beginning. And I hope that our listeners will take that message to heart uh, and join us. So Judy, thank you so much again for joining me today. I really appreciate it. As always, it's been a fascinating talk. And uh, you know, I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank, Thank you again. You, Mark. Thank you. Okay.